It is now time for questions. I recognize the member for Waterloo. My questions to the Premier. Speaker, I'd like to take a moment to catch everyone up on the Ontario Place saga. In 2021, this government announced their friends at Thermae were building an elite luxury spa on public parkland. Cut to March of this year, a city report shows a long list of problems with the plan. The spa, too big. The $450 million taxpayer-funded parking garage violates even this government's own policies. Yet the Minister of Infrastructure pressed on. They told us they signed a standard commercial lease for the spa that just happened to be for 95 years, but not so standard that it must be kept secret. There is no business case for a 95-year lease. Ontario's, uh, Ontarians already feel cheated on the 407 by the last Conservative Question. government. Speaker, to the Premier, if the lease is a standard commercial lease, when will this government release it, and why are you keeping it secret? Response: I recognize the, government. I recognize the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, great to see you in the chair, and thanks for the question. Uh, when we talk about what is happening down in Ontario Place, we talk about development, we talk about growth, we talk about opportunities. And those opportunities don't come overnight. They have to be developed. And given Ontario Place has been sitting dormant for so long, and there is still interest by industry to come down and transform Ontario Place into a destination not only for people within 30 or 40 miles, but across Ontario and the United States, this is going to be a destination that is going to impact large, medium, and small businesses that are part of tourism. Tourism needs to be continue to be supported, especially what they've gone through over the last couple of years. They're a strong, vibrant industry. They're smart, and they're making things happen. And to do something like this for Ontario Response. and for the rest of Canada and people in the United States to come visit and have a destination like this is outstanding. Thank you, Speaker. This debacle continues. Last week, they announced that they will move the Science Centre next to the elite luxury spa. They said it's beyond repair and must be torn down and then transplanted without consultation, especially with those employees at the Science Centre, to Ontario Place. Please remember that the Science Centre maintenance is the responsibility of Infrastructure Ontario, an agency of this very government. Nevertheless, the minister said she was, quote, triple-checking the numbers on the business case before they'd make it public, and, but now they're refusing, flat-out refusing. Speaker, some of this could be cleared up if they just release the financial rationale, if it exists. So, yeah. to the Premier, when will he release the business case on the Science Centre move? I recognize the Premier. Madam Speaker, we're building a world-class destination year-round now, Madam Speaker, if we left it up to the NDP and the Liberals, which we saw what happened for 15 years, it fell apart. It was decrepit. There's weeds growing up all throughout the ground. What we're doing, we're building a new amphitheater, no, no taxpayers' money through Live Nation. We're building a beautiful water park and a spa for people to uh, come and enjoy the day. We're building a world-class science centre, 300,000 square feet with exhibits. This is for the people. We know what happens when the NDP and the Liberals get involved. Right. Nothing happens. Rust happens. Weeds happen. And the last group that I'd ever listened to about being prudent fiscal managers are those two groups right there. Yeah. The Speaker, Ontarians are shocked to find out that their government has signed a 95-year lease with an Austrian corporate conglomerate to build a massive seven-story private luxury spa on public parkland, a century-long lease that this government insists must be kept secret. Yet, in 1999, the, the last Conservative government handed over a 99-year lease for Highway 407 for $3.1 billion. That's about $4.4 billion in today's numbers. Today, Highway 407 is worth $40 billion, a nearly 1,200% increase in just 24 years. What will it be worth uh, when the lease finally ends in 75 years? This government is making the same mistakes the last Conservative government did, and it, it is costing Ontarians Question. millions of dollars. The people of this province have a right to know the terms of the lease and the business case for these decisions. Release the lease if you're so proud of it. Yeah. Response, I recognize the Premier. 
Well, well, Mr. Speaker, going back to so what I said in the prior question, again, the last group that I would listen to about being fiscal managers are the NDP and Liberals that bankrupt this, this province until we came in. We're making sure that we're building transit, the Ontario line, to get people from point A to point B down to a destination, a world-class destination, a year-round destination, until families can come there, until tens of thousands of people can enjoy Ontario Place. There's a whole generation that's never experienced Ontario Place. But now, and I mark my words, uh, Madam Speaker, every single person in this room, guess what? They're going to be in the lineup to go to the Science Centre, they'll be in the lineup to go to the Live Nation show, they're going to be in the lineup to go to Ontario Place and the water park. That's what they're going to do. Hypocrisy at its best. Let's go. Nipissing Renfrew will come to order. For the questions, I recognize the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. This government announced that the earning exemption for ODSP recipients will be raised to $1,000. While this was a step in the right direction, it still does not address the issues of clawbacks from other benefits such as CPP disability. After hearing about the government's announcement about how it's going to help uh, his ODSP uh, 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 amount, a constituent, Shah Hamidi, reached out to our office with confusion. Speaker, our government is clawing back his CPP disability income to continue to keep him in poverty. So my question to the Premier is, Premier, you know the harsh reality that those with disability face. They're barely surviving. Why is your government continuing to means test ODSP and forcing people to live in legislated poverty? Ms. Cross, I recognize the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the question, Mr. Speaker. The member's right. What we did is we made sure that at a, during a very difficult time, every single Ontarian here has a chance to succeed, uh, Madam Speaker. That's why we made the largest increase to ODSB rates in decades, Madam Speaker. Not only that, not only that, Madam Speaker, it was tied to inflation, which the food bank, Madam Speaker, I'll remind my honourable colleague, referred to it as a laudable move by this government, Madam Speaker. That's not where we ended. She's absolutely right. We also made sure that the threshold, the income threshold, is raised from two hundred dollars to a thousand dollars a month. Why, Madam Speaker? So that people can have more money in their pockets, so that more people who are able to work and are want to get out there and work to fill some of the great jobs Response. that are available here in this province can do so and earn more and keep more of their hard-earned money, yeah. Madam Speaker. Questions are recognized in the Scarborough Southwest. Speaker. So essentially what we're telling people like Hamidi and others is that here is a maximum amount, you're stuck. Regardless of your benefits, of your family's income, of the federal benefits, you'll have a maximum amount. And regardless of the food prices, of the rent increase, you have this maximum amount and you have to stay below the poverty line. The earning exemption does nothing for spousal income either. Another constituent of mine, uh, Thomas Robinson, receives lower monthly income payments because of the program's, uh, program's cuts to his ODSP due to his wife's income, who, by the way, works precarious hours, leaving him with just three to four hundred dollars per month. So instead of barely surviving with the insufficient disability benefits and his wife's income, Thomas is punished because of his wife, who works precarious hours and is trying to pay the bills. So, Speaker, my question again to the Premier is: Why is this government done? Why has this government done nothing? Thing for people like Thomas and Hamidi who are unable to survive on a program designed to fail people with disabilities and their, and their families. Response, I recognize the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And again, I thank my uh, colleague for the question. And let me be clear, Madam Speaker, this government will always be there for those who can't work, Madam Speaker, which is why, as I said earlier, we increased the uh, earnings from 
$200 to $1,000 so that they can keep more of their money, which is why we increased the rates by 5 percent tied to inflation, Madam Speaker, which was the right thing to do. It wasn't done before. The people of this province were being let down, not under this leadership of this Premier, not under our government. When we say we're not going to leave anyone behind, that means every single person in this province, Madam Speaker. That's not it, Madam Speaker. We initiated the lift tax credit, the care tax credit, so that some of the lowest earners, Madam Speaker, don't have to pay the Ontario tax credit. Why? Spons. Because we wanted to make sure they keep more money in their pockets. She referenced housing, Madam Speaker. This is why the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Associate Minister of Housing, is working hard to make sure that housing becomes more affordable across our province. Other questions? I recognize the member for London North Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Conservatives have pushed Ontarians living with disabilities into legislated poverty. After Mike Harris's callous cuts in the 90s, people are worse off now than ever, and part of that is due to liberal neglect. People on ODSP can barely afford housing, but especially now, healthy food. The Middlesex London Health Unit is sending a letter urgently requesting that the province raise social assistance rates. Medical Officer of Health Dr. Alex Summers and CEO Emily Williams stated, Food insecurity has a pervasive impact on health, and there is a need for income-based solutions. Will this government listen to experts and lift ODSP recipients out of poverty? Yes or no? I recognize the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for the question. Madam Speaker, as I said earlier, every decision we make here is to make sure that every single Ontarian succeeds and is able to thrive, Madam Speaker. Again, I just remind my honourable colleague, and he's right, the previous government didn't do that. But, Madam Speaker, it's my honourable colleague and, her, and his party that had the balance of power here in this legislature. They could have made sure that those supports are provided to Ontarians. They didn't. It's this Premier, Madam Speaker, that increased the ODSB raise that Members hadn't been done in decades. Largest increase in decades, Madam Speaker. Went first to make sure that no one is left behind, tied the, the, uh, the rates to inflation for future, Madam Speaker. Again, under this government, under the leadership of this Premier, no one will be left behind. We'll make sure that not Spons. only do they have to support those that need it, we'll make sure that the 400,000 jobs that are going unfilled, Madam Speaker, thanks to the great work of the Minister of jo Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, and this Premier will make sure those who Further questions? Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Edmonton Crosstown P3 was supposed to open in 2020, then 2021, then 2022, and then 2023. The government's inability to get an updated timeline from CTX suggests a complete loss of control. Small businesses lost revenue, were forced to shut down. People have been stuck in traffic and lived with construction dust and noise for over a decade. There seems to be no attempt at accountability by this Conservative government. What is the plan on wrapping up this project, and when can we expect to get moving? Response. I recognize the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, to the member opposite, uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Uh, frustrations with respect to the delays in the Eglinton Crosstown are more than understandable, especially by those for those that are experienced by those who live along the line and the businesses who have been impacted. This contract has been in place for over a decade. And our government is very focused on making sure that we get the system open as soon as possible. I would very much like to be able to stand here today and provide a date to give the people of Toronto an idea of when this will will open. But unfortunately, Madam Speaker, we are working with a contractor that has to provide us with a credible schedule. It is essential. My number one priority as Minister of Transportation is to ensure that our transportation network is safe and reliable for everyone to use, whether it's a bridge or a road Response. or a transit system. It must be safe. And so while I would like to be able to provide a date, I cannot do so until the contractor provides us with a credible and reliable schedule. But Madam Speaker, as soon as they do that, we will provide a date. The question. I recognize the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Ba back to the Premier. The Eglinton Crosstown LRT is a mess, and sadly, I have seen this movie before. 
Its budget has doubled using the same P3 consultants that built Ottawa's struggling LRT. Phil Verster from Metrolinx noted 200, speaker, 260 deficiencies in this project at a press conference with the minister this morning, but gave the public no details at all. That is not acceptable. The newly built Sloan station had to be ripped apart this week. Metrolinx has paid out hundreds of millions of dollars to the P3 consortium building this project already, but the project is falling behind and creating deficiencies. Will the government tell this House and the public what is wrong? with the Crosstown LRT. Yes, sir. Transportation for response. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the member opposite knows that we provided in our press conference earlier today with some very specific technical examples of some of the things that we're dealing with on the Eglinton Crosstown LRT and things that we need to rectify. Because if our if Metrolinx does not take these important quality control steps, we could end up in a situation like other transit systems in this province of experience, where Politicians rush a system to open before it is ready, and then it is unsafe for transit riders. We've seen this before, and the member opposite knows it almost better than anyone in this House. And my, as Minister of Transportation, my commitment to the people of Ontario is that we will deliver a system when it is safe and reliable to use. Madam Speaker, this is important that we get this right. And we have been transparent with the people of Ontario. We are focused on making sure Response. that the system is safe. But more importantly, Madam Speaker, going forward, we're learning the lessons from Ottawa, we're learning the lessons from Crosstown, and we're moving forward with our priority projects in a way that's different. Unfortunately, Madam Speaker, the members, that, members opposite voted against that. They voted against the building transit faster. Other questions? I recognize the member for Chatham, Kent, Good morning, Speaker. Thank you. My question is for the Premier. Across our province, we're seeing more and more reports about an alarming rise in violence and major crimes impacting our communities. Our government must act now to improve public safety and provide greater protection to the people of Ontario. I was proud to serve my community as a frontline OPP officer, and I will always support my fellow officers and encourage anyone interested in joining this rewarding profession. In order to better support our police services, it's essential that our government provide improvements to the recruitment process so we can get more officers in our communities. Speaker, can the Premier please explain how our government is removing barriers for police services across the province to recruit and train more frontline officers? I recognize the Premier. Thank you so much from our great member from Chatham, Kent, Leamington. I also want to thank him for serving his community, put, putting his, his uniform on every single day getting out there to make sure he has a safe community. And he is leading the charge when it comes to bail reform, when it comes to making sure that we take care of the cost of basic training at the Ontario Police College. He understands it. There's no one in this chamber that understands it more than the member from Chatham, Kent, Leamington. <laughs> Madam Speaker, we, we have decided to make sure that we take care of the complete cost of having these uh, young people, these young women and men, go to the Ontario Police College without having the burden of $15,000, $16,000. This is going to attract more Spons. recruits to serve the people of their community. And thank you. With the questions, I recognize the member for Chatham, Kent, Leamington. Speaker, and thank you to the Premier for his response. It's very encouraging to hear that our government is providing vital support in recruiting and training new officers. These new measures send a clear and definitive message that the safety and well-being of all Ontarians is the top priority of our government. Local police services are in urgent need of more officers who are trained and equipped to respond to the ever-increasing complexity of calls. Among the many people considering a career in this profession, some have not attended a post-secondary education, but they still have valuable skills and valuable life experience to contribute and to serve their communities. Speaker, can the Premier please elaborate on the actions our government is taking to remove barriers for a career in policing? To recognize the Premier. Again, Madam Speaker, I, I want to thank the member for that question. Effective immediately, our government is expanding the basic constable training program, the Ontario Police College, to accommodate an additional 70 uh, recruits in their cohorts. We will expand the basic constable training program from co four cohorts to from three cohorts. 
So we're adding hundreds of more police officers going through the Ontario Police uh, College to make sure we keep our community safe. Madam Speaker, across Ontario, we've seen crime go up. We've seen crime go up, up unprecedented amount right here in Toronto. People are scared to go on the subway. People are scared to walk out the, their door at nighttime and take a stroll down the street. I can tell a message, I have a, a clear message for all the bad guys out there, all the criminals. You know, you cause problems in our town. We're coming to get you. We're going to throw you in jail, and you're going to be in there for a long time. Thank you. For the questions, I recognize the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the employees, the employers of West Ray Coal Mine deliberately ignored safety concerns until the day it exploded and killed 26 miners. This preventable incident resulted in Bill, Bill C-45. The West Ray law allows criminal liability of bad bosses for preventable workplace deaths and injuries. Unfortunately, Westway is nearly 20 years old and is rarely used, Speaker. The OFL and the steelworkers have worked with police forces across Ontario, and they agree that there is a need for Ontario to develop a standardized C-45 Westway law investigation policy. This policy would include the training, awareness, and resources so Ontario's police officers can be successful in investigating preventable workplace deaths. My question, Speaker, is will the Premier commit to providing Ontario with a standardized C-45 Westway law investigation policy and direct the Chiefs of Police to implement consistent protocols across Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Response, I recognize the Minister of Labour, Skills, Training, Immigration, and keep going. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and congratulations to you uh, in your role today. Uh, I want to thank the member uh, opposite for this very important question. Uh, tomorrow is uh, the day of mourning uh, in, in the province of Ontario, and our number one priority as a government is to ensure that when workers uh, go to work, they come home safely uh, to their families uh, at the end of that day. That's why uh, we're investing uh, historic amounts to ensure that we have more health and safety inspectors uh, out there. And those new health and safety inspectors that we've hired have backgrounds in the industries that they're uh, inspecting. That's why we've uh, increased the uh, health and safety action centre. If uh, there's a worker out there concerned for his or her health. They can call uh, the Ministry of Labour and we'll investigate uh, as quickly as possible. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, every single day working with our partners like the United Steelworkers Union and others across the province Response. to ensure that every worker comes home safe to their families at the end of the day. Questions? I recognize the member from St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Tomorrow is the day of mourning. My community has been in mourning ever since the explosion at SS Sonics Products in St. Catharines that claimed the life of Ryan Conkill. Over 200 workers die in the workplace every year in Ontario. That's 200 sisters like Nicole who will never get to see their Ryans again. 200 fiancés like Natalia who will never get to hear their Ryans say, I'll love you forever and a day. Speaker, the Conservative government is responsible for ensuring the criminal code in Ontario is enforced. Will the Premier commit to consulting with the community to establish a consistent policy that utilizes the West Trey law to hold bad bosses accountable when they exist for the death of Ontario workers? Response, recognizing the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you. And, um Madam Speaker, through you, uh, to all members in this House and, and to everybody across the province, uh, every worker uh, has to come home to their family at the end of the day. That's, that's our mission. That's our number one priority. Uh, we'll continue, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, strengthening health and safety laws in this province. That's why in our latest uh, Working for Workers uh, legislation that I encourage all members uh, in this House to pass and to support, uh, we've increased uh, fines for corporations. I mean, Health and safety infractions should never be a cost of doing business uh, in the province. In Working for Workers 3, uh, we've uh, set forth the, the highest fines in the country uh, to those uh, bad employers, those bad recruiters that are withholding passports and, and work permits of migrant workers to ensure that if they're withholding or they're holding those uh, documents, that they face uh, really high fines, that they face a time behind Spons. bars. And we're going to continue uh, every day uh, working with our partners, ensuring that workers are safe in this province. I recognize the member from Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Many individuals and families in my riding of Markham Thornhill need our government to address the pressing issue of transit congestion. 
whether traveling by car or bus, gridlock is a congestion is at frustration and unnecessary delay to everyone's days. My community has grown significantly, and they need greater accessibility when it's come to convenient way to connect to their job, family, and other communities in the GTA. Access to rapid transit is long overdue, and the residents in my community are looking forward to the young North subway extension. Speaker, can the minister please provide an update on the status of this critical transit project? Thank you. Response to recognize the Minister of Transportation. Madam Speaker, and the member opposite is correct. The Young North subway extension will transform the commute in York Region, North York, and beyond, extending the TTC's Line 1 from Finch Station to Vaughan, Markham, and Richmond Hill. Rather than being stuck in gridlock, the people of York Region will have access to fast and reliable rapid transit, connecting them to where they need to go. Madam Speaker, our government is focused on this project, and I am pleased to say that we have reached another milestone. <clears throat> Just this morning, I announced that our government has officially started procurement, releasing the re request for qualifications for tunneling work. This builds on the important work that's already underway at Finch Station, where workers are making upgrades to accommodate future subway service. Madam Speaker, with procurement now underway, we are Spons. full steam ahead on this project, and the people of York Region and Toronto have every reason to be excited. Question, I recognize the member from Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to congratulate the Minister for reaching such a significant milestone in this project. While the people of Ontario are seeing progress on many public transit projects. It remains critical that our government continue to make transit infrastructure investment is a priority. We are the previous Liberal government failed to plan ahead for the transit need of our communities. Our government must deliver on our commitment to build the transit solution that are so vital for our province. Yes. Speaker, can the minister please explain why these investments are so important for Ontario and what the benefit the young North Subway extension will have for everyone. Thank you. Back to the Minister of Transportation for response. Speaker, our government's investment in investments in public transit, such as the young North Subway extension, signal to the world that Ontario is building the infrastructure that will create jobs and spur economic growth and make life easier for people. Why, Madam Speaker? Because this is about building the type of province that we want to live in, a province where communities are connected to each other, a province that's open for business, and a province where people want to raise a family and call home. And, Madam Speaker, we know our message is being heard around the world, from the investments companies like Volkswagen are making in Ontario, or the approximately 200,000 people who moved to Canada last year and now call Ontario home for too long. The hardworking people of York Region waited, and they asked for fast access to subway service to get where they need to go, whether it's to their job, to run errands, or to go catch a Jays game with friends in the city. Response. Madam Speaker, unlike the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP, it's this government that's building the transit of the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Premier. In 2019, this government put out a call for development for Ontario Place. The call for development document warned prospective bidders, quote, participants should consider the adequacy of parking for the development concept, unquote. The document made it clear to bidders that their proposals must work with the parking available and not to expect additional parking. And yet, after Therma had won the bid, this government announced that it was building a $450 million parking garage that was not mentioned in the call for development. Why is the Premier giving Therma a publicly funded $450 million benefit that was not offered to competing bidders? Response. I recognize the Minister of Sport, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Uh, the member for Waterloo uh, will come to order. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. And I, I'm not sure which one they want me to answer. As far as someone from out of town supporting and coming into Ontario, uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. With respect to the growth, I think adjustments have to be made in any type of project. And when you make adjustments, you base it on what is going on around you. The business case in many situations, regardless of whether it's building or developing or 
let's say moving a science centre from one spot to another because it's going to be better not only for the people that have a chance to go visit, maybe up to a million people that are going to come down there. So you have to be able to accommodate what you plan on building. So to do that, you have to adjust and, and certainly swing one way or the other based on what is going on. And I think this is a great example of development looking into the future, what's Response. going to happen down at Ontario Place, and the great advantage that we will have as a destination, one of the best in the world, to drive tourism in our province. Yeah, the question is actually about the fairness of the bidding process, and again to the Premier. According to Ontario's lobbyist registry, starting in September 2018, PC party insiders have been lobbying the Ford government on behalf of Therma. These lobbyists include Amir Remtoul of Mayor Ford's former chief of staff, as well as prominent PC party activist Leslie Noble. It looks like Therma has gotten its money's worth because it is now benefiting from a, a publicly funded $450 million parking garage that was not offered to its competitors bidding for the right to redevelop Ontario Place. Prior to awarding the Ontario Place contract to Therma, did the Ford government or anyone else give Therma reason to believe that the Ford government would later sweeten the deal with a publicly funded parking garage? Response. Recognize the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Again, uh, thank you for the question and uh, thanks for the, the support. I think that, again, we have to continue to look at uh, development of an opportunity that has been sitting vacant for many, many years. And to the Premier's point, when we talk about looking at creating opportunity for millions and millions of Ontarians and outside of Ontario when it comes to a tourism attraction, I think we have to be able to adjust as time goes on. So from my perspective and all the great people that I've met in my tours and tourism around this province, they are excited to what this government and our Premier is doing to help support tourism and drive business and drive the economy. Questions? I recognize the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. The previous Liberal government drove jobs out of our province and failed to unlock Ontario's full economic potential. The negative results of their destructive economic policies left many behind, including those from rural, remote and Indigenous communities. In contrast, our government must be focused on solutions that will help grow our economy. In my community of Brantford Brant, we see what is possible when governments work in partnership with Indigenous communities as equal partners in major infrastructure initiatives. For example, the Oneida Energy Storage Project is a significant Indigenous-led development that will create good jobs and support prosperity to Six Nations and the surrounding area. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to further enhance economic prosperity in partnership with Indigenous communities. Thank you. Response. I recognize the Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Brantford Brant for his extraordinary work, not just in his riding, but working closely with Six Nations of the Grand River. Uh, Mr. Spe uh, Madam Speaker, it's true that the Ontario, the Oneida Energy Storage Project uh, is one of a kind, and it's an exciting opportunity when political leadership aligns with its economic development priorities, goes out proactively and joins with major partners uh, in the corporate world, Madam Speaker, and delivers on projects that benefit the community, the surrounding area, and the entire province when it comes to the scope of this project. And that's exactly what we were talking about in Vancouver earlier this week with the First Nations Management uh, Project Coalition. A growing membership of Indigenous leaders and major businesses converging on the opportunity to grow infrastructure, Response. to build out opportunities for youth, Indigenous youth and ensure that they are a critical part of every resource project and every major critical infrastructure project across this country and most notably in Ontario. Thank you. So the questions are back to the member from Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. The insights shared by the minister in his response demonstrate that our government is building on current successes and is continuing to move forward in strengthening relationships with Indigenous partners. We know that by forming and maintaining these strong relationships, we are advancing economic development and success across our province. Our government must understand that we need to support and invest in programs that will create 
good-paying jobs and economic opportunities for Indigenous peoples in Ontario. Individuals, families, businesses and communities can all succeed when they have the tools, the training and the supports that they need. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting the ongoing economic growth and prosperity for Indigenous communities? Thank you. Back to the Mem Minister of Northern Development and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Madam Speaker. One of the ways that we do this is we go out and tell uh, people uh, around the world, across this country, Madam Speaker, about the extraordinary opportunities in store for the province of Ontario, and that it includes Indigenous businesses, Indigenous leadership that want to rally around these great opportunities. You know, the First Nations uh, Major Project Coalition is le helping to leverage and support the development of 40 billion dollars worth of infrastructure, Madam Speaker. It covers myriad kinds of projects, but at the heart and soul of it is a values-driven opportunity, Madam Speaker, to ensure that major financial institutes, major energy companies, major infrastructure construction companies are in play, working together with Indigenous leadership like uh, communities from uh, the Ring of Fire, like the opportunities that we're seeing with Indigenous communities Response. in southwestern Ontario's corridor from St. Thomas to Windsor to make sure that Ontario's bright future includes Indigenous young people, Indigenous businesses, and a better sense of prosperity for all people in Ontario moving forward. Question. I recognize the members of Toronto Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker, and to the Premier. Last June, the Norwich BIA put up pride banners only to have dozens removed, vandalized, and then burned. This week, Norwich Town Council voted to ban pride flags from municipal property and then rejected pro to proclaim Pride Month, which is coming up in June. Since the Premier has not spoken up against the hateful rise of homophobia and transphobia in Ontario, I'd like to ask him today, will he break his silence and commit to working with the Ontario NDP to pass our bill, keeping 2S LGBT plus communities safe as quickly as possible? Response. I recognize the government house leader. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, uh, look, the, the member knows uh, full well that the, uh, the private member bill process in this place uh, 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 has a, a schedule in which it works under, and uh, members uh, on, the, on the House will give it uh, uh, due consideration. I know that uh, uh, the Minister of Multiculturalism, though, has been working very, very closely to ensure that we have a very inclusive uh, uh, Ontario. It is something that I'm sure that members on all sides of the House uh, would agree on that we have to continue to do that work. I know uh, uh, the minister also has uh, has been reaching out and ensuring that there are continuous there are continuous consultations. But Mr. Speaker, it, Madam Speaker, excuse me, uh, it is also the work that is being done uh, by the Solicitor General uh, and the Attorney General to ensure that we have communities that are safe for all people. That is what this government has been doing right from the beginning. Now, Mr. S Madam Speaker, I apologize for that, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Madam Speaker, later on today, members uh, from the NDP will have the opportunity opportunity to put their money where their mouth is when it comes to law and Response. order in the province of Ontario. They spoke against a bill that the Solicitor General brought forward last night, but I suspect, Madam Speaker, despite every speech being against that bill, that they will do the right thing today and they will vote in favour of our police and community and law and order in the province of Ontario. Thank you. Speaker, thank you. I'm sure that the community is going to be very disappointed to know that this government is not going to take action to protect them, especially with the rise of homophobia and hate right across the, the province. This week, an angry mob also turned up at the York Catholic District School Board, where they disrupted a meeting and to intimidate the trustees to vote against Pride Month and raising the flag for, for their community. This is not the first time that the police were called in to contain homophobic violence. If the Premier is unwilling to adopt our anti- uh, 2S LGBT strategy hate crime um, uh, plan. What is the Premier's plan to, to actually keep students safe? What is he going to do while they attend publicly funded schools? Back to the government house leader for response. I think uh, the Minister of Education has actually been very clear on that, uh, on that Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, as has the Minister of Multiculturalism and Citizenship, who has been doing a tremendous amount of work, not only with that community, but with all communities in this province who feel that they may, not, they may need some uh, uh, extra pr uh, protections, uh, Madam Speaker. But at the same time, 
At the same time, we're hearing the member right now just talk about how important it is to keep the people of the province of Ontario safe, whether it is that community, whether it is other communities across the province of Ontario, whether it is students. Now, yesterday, the Solicitor General and the Attorney General of this province deposited a bill in this House that was up for debate for 10 hours, and speaker after speaker after speaker on the NDP side spoke against the provisions in that bill. Madam Speaker, they spoke against the provisions in Response. that bill. But after question period today, the member and her colleagues will have the opportunity to do exactly what that member asked for: vote to keep our communities safe. Now, despite their opposition, I hope they will do the right thing and have reflected and will vote in favour of that bill here, in here. 21 minutes. The questions. I recognize the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. April is designated as Dig Safe Month in Ontario. This month is dedicated to raising awareness about safe digging practices across our province. A recent survey reveals that two out of three Ontarians planning to dig this year could be putting themselves and their community at risk by digging in locations where buried cables, pipes and wires are located. Damaging underground infrastructure is dangerous and can cause serious injuries and carry severe financial consequences. That's why, Speaker, I would like to salute the member from Sarnia-Lambton and former MPP Paul Miller for their incredible work and passage of their Ontario One Call private members' bill. Speaker, can the minister please provide more information about Dig Safe Month and the role that Ontario One Call plays in protecting public safety? Thank you. Response. I recognize the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brantford Brand for uh, the question and for taking the time to raise awareness of this important topic. Uh, for many, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, this might sound like a simple thing, but underground locates uh, are a critical step to ensure that communities and workers remain safe and that we don't accidentally create service outages or damage underground infrastructure when we build. Uh, Madam Speaker, for example, telecommunication failures can cripple a business or cut off a person's access to emergency services, posing a very real threat to the safety of Ontarians. Speaker, that is why we continue to work with Ontario One Call to protect the well-being of Ontarians and their communities, just as this Spons. government has done since day one. Thank you. Supplementary, I recognize the member from Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. It's encouraging to hear about our government's unprecedented investments into critical infrastructure projects that will provide communities across Ontario with the supports and services they need to grow and to thrive. As we move forward with building more homes, more highways, and more hospitals across our province, there is an increasing demand for enhanced underground infrastructure mapping. This underground mapping is vital to determine where pipes, cables, and wires are currently located. Our government must ensure that sufficient underground mapping services are in place to support the many construction projects, both big and small, that are currently underway across our entire province. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is working closely with Ontario One Call to protect Ontario's communities and our underground infrastructure works? Thank you. Back to the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery for response. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my honourable colleague for the question. Uh, Madam Speaker, just over uh, one year ago, our government passed the Getting Ontario Connected Act, which, amongst other things, made amendments to improve the locate delivery system, enhance governance and oversight of Ontario One Call, and improve compliance tools. Uh, speaker, and if I may, I want to commend the incredible work by our Minister of Infrastructure, the Honourable Kinga Surma, to build this important piece of legislation, as well as the great member from Sarnia Lambton, MPP Bob Bailey, for, for having worked with his colleagues across the aisle in 2012 to bring about Ontario One Call as we know it today. Response. So, Madam Speaker, whether you are planting a tree, building a fence, or planning to dig for any reason, remember to visit 
ontarioonecall.ca to learn more about how to request a locate in just a few simple steps. Thank you. The question I recognize the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question for the Minister of the Santé. To the Minister of Health. Speaker. Residents of Minden and surrounding area are here today in the gallery and on the front lawn. They were shocked last week to learn that their emergency room will close on June 1st. So in one week, they have gathered thousands of names on a petition for a simple ask to the minister, a one-year moratorium on that decision. Will the minister listen to the good people of Minden and grant the one-year moratorium on the closing of their emergency room? Response, I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, and it's great to see you in the chair, Speaker. You know, I know that the member opposite knows very well that hospitals are responsible for their day-to-day -day operations and make those decisions independent of the Ministry of Health and Government. The, we have been assured that the, uh, the Halliburton Highlands Health Science Board and leadership have made this decision carefully, thoughtfully, understanding and appreciating the needs of their community and their staff, and I will let them do that work. Thank you. I recognize the member from Nickelbelt. The Ministry of Health is the biggest ministry in this government. Hospitals is the biggest responsibility of that minister. Speaker, the people of Milden stand with their city council and will leave no stone unturned to alter this ill-advised, ill-timed and ill-planned decision. Minden Emergency Department had 13,000 visits last year, and the numbers are only going up. This town of 7,000 people if triples in size through the summer with the seasonal resident and the tourist that comes to the area. Yet, no one was consulted on this decision to close the emergency department. The government has the opportunity to ask, will they help keep the Minden Hospital Emergency Department open for one more year. Yeah. Response, I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I will remind the member opposite, these are decisions that are made at the local level using the uh, information that the local leadership and the local board have. You know, our government continues to support hospitals in many ways, including the Halliburton Highlands Health Services, which we have increased funding by 11 per cent since we came into office. This is not a funding conversation. This is a conversation that the hospital leadership, the hospital board has made based on the needs of the community and appreciating that they want to, to best serve the community, and they've done that. Thank you. Questions? I recognize the member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Great to be here. Ontario is facing a historic labour shortage with over 360,000 jobs going unfilled. I left if left unaddressed, this situation will cost billions to our economy and lost productivity. We know that women make up almost half of the Canadian labour force, but unfortunately hold less than 25 per cent of the jobs in the tax sector and less than 4 per cent of jobs in the skilled trades. Additionally, women often face added barriers when entering or re-entering the workforce. Our government must focus on measures to provide Question. women with the resources they need to achieve their full economic potential. Speaker, can the, can the Associate Minister please share what our government is doing to economically empower women in our province? Response. I recognize the Associate Minister of Women's Economic and Social Opportunities. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member from New Market Aurora for their question and their advocacy on creating more economic opportunities in their riding, but also across the province. Madam Speaker, just last month I announced the expansion of the Investing in Women's Futures program to 10 new locations across the province, bringing the total number of service locations to 33. And last Friday, I had the pleasure of visiting Operation Grow.
It's in Midland, and I was there with the member from North Simcoe, um, Simcoe North, and the Minister of Colleges and Universities to announce that they will be the next location receiving the Investing in Women's Futures program <laughs> funding. Operation Grow, Madam Speaker, is a social enterprise operated by Heronia Transition Homes, and they empower women who have experienced violence, access, skill-building workshops Response. in their commercial kitchen, and their state-of-the-art vertical farm. They grow fee food to feed their communities and also empower women to develop skills to be able to secure employment. Question. Back to the member from the Market Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. I am pleased and encouraged to hear about our government's support for these great community organizations throughout our province, including Women's Centre of York Region in my riding. And I would like to thank the Associate Minister and the Minister of Labour who visited my riding a few weeks ago. There is an optimistic future for all women in our province because of organizations like these ones. That said, our government understands that some women encounter social and economic barriers in obtaining the support that they require. It is essential that every woman should have access to these important programs, no matter where they live in our province. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please elaborate on how our government is helping women across Ontario to develop the skills that they need to gain financial security and independence? Response and recognize the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunities. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member uh, again for that important question, and I'm grateful to, for the opportunity to respond. Um, in addition to Midland, Madam Speaker, the Investing in Women's Future program will now be uh, delivered in Toronto, Brampton, Mississauga, Pickering, Newmarket, Kingston, Killillo, Elliott Lake, and Kirkland Lake. And these programs will be led by community-based, locally informed organizations and will provide a range of flexible programs and services um, like counseling, safety planning, legal rights workshops, life skills, self-esteem workshops, financial literacy, and employment readiness, skills development, and business development. Some programs will also provide wraparound supports to enable women to participate, like Response. transportation, childcare, and mental health supports. Under the leadership of our Premier and this government, we will continue to empower women across this province because we believe that when women succeed on Question. I recognize the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The District School Board of Niagara, like many school boards in Ontario, are facing significant financial pressures. Since Christmas, the board has welcomed 400 new students who are relocated to Niagara to immigration, refugees, and citizen Canada. The board has requested 500,000 in additional target funding for the unique learning challenges faced by these students, including multi-language resource teachers, social workers, and translation software. After repeated follow-ups with the minister, the school board is still waiting for support. Why is their minister, premier sorry, refusing to act and provide the necessary resources to keep classrooms functioning and students properly supported in Niagara? Response. I recognize the member for Ajax. Thank you for the question, Speaker. Thank you. Our government has increased funding to our school boards year after year since taking office. That includes a $26.7 billion in base GSN funding for the next school year, an increase of over $700 million this year alone, a 14% increase since 2017 to 18. Since the 2002-2003 school year, staffing has increased by nearly 8,000, despite student enrollment remaining the same across the boards. We continue to be very dedicated to our school boards and our school boards and our students' success. We, in total, nearly hired 2,000 new frontline educators, which will be hired and supported by the overall education funding, which is the highest levels in Ontario Response. history. Nearly 1,000 additional skilled math and literacy educators to boost skills across our, our boards. We believe in our students' success and achievement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Niagara School Board has been promised the funding 
Please just answer the question. It's important to Niagara. I want to be clear. This is a very real and very urgent issue that the board needs to address. The board has spent an additional 300,000 outside of their regular spending models. At this rate, it's not sustainable. The need to support from the province to ensure students in Niagara are receiving the education and support they need and deserve. Our education workers, our teachers deserve to have the resources needed to provide quality education in our school. Will the premier commit? Will the premier commit? to follow up with the District School Board of Niagara and ensure they have the necessary funding to support all students in our community. Thank you. Back to the member from Ajax for response. Thank you, Speaker. And that is exactly the reason why we have introduced the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act, and we ask the, the members to, to continue to support it, to support students across the province and building off the approximately 8,000 additional staff hired to 2000. 2018, improving accountability and transparency by allowing the minister to set priorities in important areas and subject on student achievement like reading, math, and required school boards to update parents on progress. Requiring school boards to publicly post their multi-year board improvement plan that reflects the priorities of student achievement and, and accountability to teach to parents. Directing school board to increase engagement and reporting to parents on student achievement and ensuring and students have easy access to the information they need to make meaningful engagement with their children's Response. education and success. This is why we are asking for accountability, because we continue to believe that students are very important in our province, and we continue to want them to be successful. I recognize the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Recently, the Northern Ontario Large Urban Mayor Group met to discuss the status of mental health and addiction services in northern communities. Our northern cities and towns are unfortunately facing higher rates of overdoses than the rest of the province, and residents of the north often have to travel greater distances to access services. These are serious health issues affecting our communities, and our government must take immediate action to improve people's lives who are struggling with substance abuse. Speaker. Can the Associate Minister please explain what actions our government is taking to improve mental health and addiction services in rural, remote and northern communities? Thank you. Response. I recognize the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the member for this question for the, and for the amazing work that he does for his constituents. Madam Speaker, the opioid crisis has hit northern communities particularly hard, and that's why we're focused on building a continuum of care that covers the entire province. Of the 400 new treatment beds and 7,000 new treatment spaces that have been created through the Addictions Recovery Fund, over half of them have gone to northern and indigenous communities. Our investments through the Roadmap to Wellness and the Addictions Recovery Fund has funded things like the mobile crisis response teams, mobile mental health clinics, wraparound supports and treatment beds that are filling the gaps in care that have been experienced by those in the north. Madam Speaker, through our ongoing partnerships with amazing community Thanks. organizations like St. Joseph's and Dillico Anishinaabeg Family Care in Thunder Bay, Canada College in North, North Bay, Algoma Family Services, we're making sure that the wellness of Northern Ontarians will never again be an oversight. Follow up. I recognize the member for Brantford Grant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. Unfortunately, Speaker, for young people in rural, remote, and northern communities who are in need of help, some services and supports are fragmented and not readily available. And that is why it is critical that we strengthen the mental health support networks and make the vital investments in prevention and early intervention. It is essential that our government prioritizes local service delivery to ensure that programs are equitable and meet the needs of individuals and communities in an accessible and timely manner. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is providing access to critical mental health and addiction support for children and youth when and where they need them the most? Thank you. Response back to the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, again, the member is absolutely right about the importance of providing safe, low-barrier access to mental health and addiction supports for our children and youth. 
Since 2019, our government has invested over $130 million to improve and expand those services. And just last year, we added another $31 million in annual funding to reduce wait lists so that kids can get help sooner. And we've also provided funding for the creation of 22 youth wellness hubs across the province of Ontario, including one that's scheduled to open next month in downtown Sault Ste. Marie. We funded a youth wellness hub in Sagamuk, in one of the Indigenous communities, and along with our uh, friends up north in uh, Kenora Rainy River, along with the Kenora Chiefs Advisory, we've, we funded beds for children and youth that are of Indigenous and non-Indigenous origin. Ma Madam Speaker, the seat. Further questions? I recognize the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This government announced their new pilot program connecting children and youth with specialized care on March 9th, partnering with three hospitals, including the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario. Sonia, a mother of a child with autism, shared with me that she called CHEO on the very day of the announcement, and staff had no idea what she was talking about. They could not answer any of her questions on who could enroll how to enroll or what the program specifically offered. She could not get the basic information, let alone enroll her child. Staff told Tanya they would follow up with her. And when they, she called back two days later, Question. the program was already filled. Can the Premier, how can the Premier boast about a pilot program when their government cannot even ensure the hospitals who are administering the, administering the program? Response. I recognize the Minister of Health. Thank you. So, as I've said, when we we highlighted this pilot project that is available at Holland Bloorview. Hamilton, Chio, um, and Sick Kids. It really is an opportunity to make sure that those youth, those children, have those wraparound services. It is a very exciting pilot project, and we will monitor very care carefully to see uh, how they can actually improve the access to service for those uh, young people and their, their families. But I will remind the member opposite: a pilot project means that we may we need the data. We need the material to see whether it is, it is an effective one. And as I said that day at the announcement, if this turns into a program that will help many people and many families, we will absolutely work together to ensure that we can expand it. Thank you.